Hello and welcome to Wasted Potential, where we discuss the wasted potential of our favourite plotlines. Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade have had it rough in the Netherrealm era. You wouldn't think that given they're the only heroes from 2011 that never end up corrupted. They get together because they love each other, or because Sonya gets pregnant, because Netherrealm evidently had no one checking Kittleson's writing for the comic to correct his mistakes. Sonya dedicates herself to her work, driving a rift between her and her family, leading to a divorce. Their daughter then saves Earthrealm, and Sonya learns to value her family, despite having already learned this lesson back in the comic for the aforementioned reasons. And then, having finally reconciled at the end of MKX, Sonya dies in MK11's opening chapter, effectively making all that development their relationship had over the course of MKX feel pointless. Johnny and Cassie have all of one cutscene to mourn her before her and Johnny's past selves arrive via the time merger. Past Sonya gets pissy when she finds out that Cassie left her to die on the mission for some cheap drama, but they reconcile soon after. Johnny, who I'm shocked didn't quote the Skyrim meme in his intros, takes a bullet in the knee and is never seen again, while the past versions of the duo finally come around to the idea that they could become a thing, and then sit out the final battle completely. The fate of time itself hangs in the balance, but they're out of action from minor injuries that Raiden could easily heal in a second, and actually does in aftermath, while Cassie takes multiple minigun rounds to the shoulder and still takes part. Then again, maybe it's better that they stayed out, or Netherrealm might have used the model of the dead version of Sonya in a cutscene like they did with Scorpion. And let's not even discuss the one aftermath scene. All of this is just so weak. They get nothing to do. But I think there are storylines in the game that could have worked far better had we changed the characters involved. First, let's discuss Sonya's storyline. Present Sonya tells Cassie to leave her behind and finish the mission, resulting in her death when the Bone Temple collapses. Past Sonya learns about this, and thanks to stopping partway through the report, misses the important context that it was her own order, and falls out with Cassie. This is idiotic for multiple reasons. For one, you'd think she'd be thorough enough in her intel gathering to listen to the full recording instead of stopping halfway through. Second, this was obviously a difficult order for Cassie to give, sacrificing her own mother, but Sonya doesn't stop to think about how hard it was for her daughter because she's too selfish all of a sudden. Yes, yeah, she's only just met Cassie and doesn't really see her as her daughter yet, and one could argue that Sony is currently blinded by emotions since she now knows how she's going to die. However, she was hardly devastated when she received the news of her death. Son of a bitch. Seriously? And you'd think the daughter of Major Herman Blade, military brat Sonya Blade, US Special Forces Lieutenant at age 26, probably enlisted right out of high school, would understand the importance of completing the mission, even if it means sacrificing one of your men, or even your commanding officer to do so. This plot was not thought out at all, and turned Sonya into a petty, unempathetic, undisciplined asshole, which I felt made this version undeserving of being the one to finally canonically kill Kano. This is a story where Cassie Cage has to sacrifice one of her own parents to complete the mission, resulting in said parents' past self displaying a total lack of understanding of any military protocol or discipline, and selfishly disregarding how difficult it clearly was for Cassie to make that call because they're too focused on themselves. Make that character Johnny! Have the older Johnny die in the opening mission, leaving behind a grieving wife and daughter. Past Johnny, the egotistical, narcissistic actor who has not yet begun his military service, does not understand this basic military principle and feels betrayed by Cassie. Past Sonya finds Johnny's response abhorrent and immature, putting further distance between the two and putting Cassie's very existence in jeopardy. One character arc later, Johnny has come to terms with his fate, possibly after Cassie gets shot by Kano and wants Johnny and Sonya to leave her behind to buy them time, so he apologises to his daughter and tells her that he's proud of her for having the strength to leave him behind and soldier on. Past Sonya witnesses this change, forgives Johnny, and begins to understand what kind of a man he will one day be, and warms up to the idea of the two becoming a couple. Now it actually makes sense for the characters and doesn't ruin anyone, even if it is still a little cheap. Sure, this would cost us the interaction between the two Johnnies, which many cite as the highlight of the campaign, but I'd happily pay that price. After all, present Johnny doesn't feel like Johnny anyway, because in MKX and Eleven, both he and Cassie take the piss out of everyone in intros, but they get super serious in the campaigns. I get that they've suffered a recent loss, but there's barely any joke in our banter here to make them feel like the same characters. And then, in order to create a greater contrast between the two versions, the writers chose to completely flanderise past Johnny into far more of a twat than he ever was before. The shockingly tactless thing he says about Sonya is beyond anything Johnny would have said back in 2011, so it all feels insincere to me. It's like how the 89 Ninja Turtles were made into incompetent jokes in Turtles Forever, while the 4 Kids Turtles got to be cool serious badasses. And considering the kind of guy past Johnny is, it's hard not to look at it as yet more of Netherrealm's ineptly implemented progressive agenda by over-exaggerating how much of a self-absorbed womanizer he was to make that kind of person look bad. The other storyline I'd like to reassign is Jax's. While past Jax bonds with Jackie, present Jax is a washed up retired widow as his wife Vera died between games, driving him into an alcoholic depression. Kronika offers him a better life with his daughter not needing to join the SF so long as he works for her. After fighting his past self and losing, he barely resists as Cetron threatens to kill Jackie and is finally convinced to switch sides when he loses to Raiden because having a chapter later in the story gives Raiden the power to bring about change and resolution to characters in their arcs, while characters with real connections to them fail utterly, e.g. Sub-Zero. I like Jax, but his playstyle has barely changed since 
MK2 and he isn't fun to play, his daughter's playstyle is too similar to his on the surface, and she isn't an interesting character making them feel like a waste of roster space and a drain on the story, when we could have swapped those two out for characters with yet unfulfilled arcs. Given the chance, I would have dropped the Briggses from the story entirely. In my version, those two are gone, off battling the Red Dragon with Kenshi and Takeda. I get that Jax is a classic character and Jackie was easily the combat kid most in need of some development, but I think, given that the game ends with another fresh start, the roster really should have prioritised characters with unfinished storylines in this timeline to give them some closure, and then figured out Jackie next time. In their places are another combat kid and another parent, Kung Jin and Sindel. Kung Jin still needs to have his showdown with Revenant Kung Lao, joining the past version for the Shaolin Monks chapter. Jade is removed from the chapter since she already loses three times. Instead, the player gets to fight both Revenant Monks, with options for both Jin beating up his turncoat cousin, or Lao continuing to prove the objective failure of the Revenant process. Sindel has a Revenant and human form, with the human version having visions of past timelines because she is resurrected as she is brought through time. She seeks to end her Revenant self and save her daughter and people, working as a duo with Katana to unite Outworld and kill Shao Kahn together. The Revenant version is around to make Cabal feel like less of a fifth wheel, ultimately going down alongside Khan. I have intros between this version of Sindel and the rest of the cast in the description. Despite being one of the most controversial aspects of MK11's story, I like Jax's role in theory, but it's held back by the fact that Jax's descent into depression and alcoholism is a result of Vera dying. She only ever appeared in the comic, never in the games outside of a cameo in Jax's ending here. If you never read the comic, and I can't say I blame you, then Vera is not a character. She is a concept, the concept of Jax's wife and Jackie's mother. I think that, if Jax had been mourning a real character, fans might have had an easier time empathising with his plight and been better able to understand his desperate willingness to serve Kronika. It would also help if the daughter he was doing this for was at all interesting and likeable, and if he had interacted with her more than one time over the radio in MKX. It fails for the same reason Assassin's Creed 3 fails. Connor is motivated by the desire to avenge his mother, but the two share only a single scene together under exceptional circumstances, so we have no idea what their normal dynamic is like beyond mother and son. The audience will struggle to get invested if they don't have a firm idea of the active character's relationship to the one motivating them. So yes, I would give this role to Sonya. Now you might be wondering why I just tossed Jax and Jackie aside when I said in the critique that I liked Jackie's fears about her existence being in jeopardy. Well, that can easily be transferred to Cassie, either by the falling out of Sonya and Johnny, or by the idea that the past selves can change their futures and could erase her. After all, they haven't reached the point where everyone dies and leaves the two to protect Earthrealm pretty much alone and grow closer as a result, and you can have Raiden make a comment about his visions indicating they were never together in the previous timeline. The Sony version can go one of two ways. One sticks to the canon with her dying. Then, when Kronika rewinds time to restore the Bone Temple, Sony is brought back along with it and captured. Seeing how we're dealing with Kronika and her various allies here, Sony is turned to Kronika's side either by forced automation from Frost, the Revenant process, or simple coercion like we see with Jax. Either way, she resurfaces serving Kronika, thus making Cassie feel even worse about the whole situation. Or we follow the scenario where Johnny dies. Cassie is in deep mourning for a few chapters, having been the one to give the order. After all, Johnny's the parent who raised her and had the strongest influence on her development. He's always been there for her, and now he's... gone. As for Sonya, she is equally devastated. Given how young Cassie looks in Johnny's ending at a time when Johnny and Sonya have evidently already split up, the two were divorced for most of Cassie's life. They only recently reconnected two years ago, and that's over now. Forever. Sonya assigned the squads. She sent Johnny on that mission, she sent Cassie with him, putting her in that unenviable position where she had to give the order to abandon her own father to complete the mission. And to top it all off, Johnny's narcissistic past self is now holding Cassie accountable for his death and basically disowning her, only making their daughter feel even worse. And with Jax and Jackie away and off the grid, both Blade women have lost their closest confidants. Oh sure, the two could talk to each other, but they spent so little time together before MKX that they don't really feel like family without the glue that was Johnny holding them together. Even after having lost Jax, her father, and her twin brother if that's still canon, Sonya has never felt so bad in her 50 or 55 years of life. Kronika then makes her offer to Sonya. She shows Sonya a vision of the new life she offers for her and her family, where Johnny is still alive and Cassie never has to join the SF and leave her father to die. Maybe she enters the film industry as a director, father and daughter having a blast making countless smash hit movies together. Sonya is in mourning. She wants her husband back. She wants to make up for all of her daughter's life she missed due to her work, to the point of vastly overcompensating. Sonya agrees to serve Kronika, appearing augmented on Shang Tsung's island later, and fulfilling much the same role as Jax until her daughter and past Johnny can get through to her. Ideally, we'd play as one of the cages here, but if not, at least have Raiden say that they can't beat Sony with her augments, but he can, and he's able to disable them in the fight. Then, after making up with the others, she joins them in the final battle, possibly killing Kano after 30 long years. 
This way, the character driven to desperation is a character who's had more screen time than a glorified cameo, is in mourning over the death of an actual character, and a fan favourite character at that, instead of a nobody who was only mentioned once in the previous game and never appeared on screen outside of like three pages of the comic. The resolution is brought about by people who matter to them instead of Raiden, who hadn't interacted with Jax at all since they and Johnny tracked down Sonya in Outworld back in MK9, and it would avoid accusations of the women in refrigerators trope by not having three out of the four combat kids with dead mothers. And I know it's supposed to be building on Jax's PTSD from his time as a Revenant, but he seemed pretty over it by the time he was beating down his former Revenant comrades in the Nether Realm. With so much of the story in MKX revolving around this family unit, it's shocking that all they got this time was some cheap drama that completely derailed the characters of both parents' younger incarnations. Also, yes, I'm aware that it would be a terrible idea to hinge this big emotional arc on Sonya in the game where she is played by someone who has only spurred the title of worst actor in MK11 because they included a DJ who doesn't speak English as his first language. Luckily, this version of the game exists in a universe where Netherrealm aren't nearly as incompetent and either kept Trisha Helfer or had either Dana Lynn Barron or Jennifer Hale reprise the role. Any of those three could have really brought this arc to life. The only real issue with this approach is that this means even more of the story is focused on the cages, but as the ones who held down the fort for Liu Kang and Raiden between games, I'd say they should get some major focus here instead of being dumped into a forced side story with Kano that really doesn't amount to anything. And that's how I would have approached Johnny and Sonya in MK11. This version is truer to the characters and lets them be the focus of a real storyline that goes somewhere instead of arguably the least important B-plot of the story. As for Aftermath, Sonya is talked around by Fujin and helps out in the finale, while Cassie and the past versions are just captured and the subject of breeding slaves never comes up, because Jesus fucking Christ, what is with all the weird sex shit in this game? If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended video is Mortal Kombat 11 Sonya Socks by Sonic Heart XD, whose delivery is unironically more convincing than Ronda's. Hell, the text-to-speech voice he uses shows more emotion than her.